very, very warm welcome to everybody to this Q&A. Um, I am not Jem Bendel, I am Katie Carr and I'm hosting the next couple of Q&As for him. And I am particularly excited to be here with all of you and speaking with Xu Liang today. Um, I have known Xu, I think it was nearly three years ago that we met in Bristol, very, very briefly. And um, we have, yeah, worked together on a number of things, um, particularly serving as holding group members for the Deep Adaptation Forum. And um, yeah, I really, really enjoyed getting to know you and your work on Deep Adaptation over this time. So it's really, really great to be here and be able to sh share some of that with other members here. So we will be... Um, this is an open Q&A and it's quite a small intimate group today. So um, I really want to encourage you to take the opportunity to ask questions of Shu and you can um, share those in the chat box with Stuart. Q and, uh, Shu and I will be chatting for about half an hour and then we'll open up to questions to other people in the room. So hi Shu, thank you for joining. Hi Katie, thank you. Thank you for having me. All right, it's a pleasure. It's a pleasure. So as a little bit of introduction, um, Shu is founder and director of Day of Adaptation, which is a non-profit profit based in the Netherlands. And Shu, you're Chinese Canadian and you're living in Harlem at the moment. And um, Shu's master's degree is in disaster risk management and climate change adaptation. And that's from Lund University in Sweden. And Shu has previously worked at the World Food Programme in Kenya and the Global Centre on Adaptation. And Shu, all of that is really exciting. Um, and I'm really, really curious to hear something more about you as a person. So can you tell us about yourself, please? Thank you, Katie. Let's get personal. Um, I am uh, obviously not Dutch, as you can tell, not a uh, typical Dutch, a Dutch person, at least. Um, I'm Chinese Canadian, uh, born and raised in China, moved to Canada when I was 18. Um, so for if you want to place me in a context, I'm 100% Canadian, as was well 100% Chinese and now living in Netherlands for four years. So probably there's a mix of uh, Dutch in me as well by now. Um, the personal side of the experience, uh, I would say, is um, it's, it's, it's a process of adaptation, uh, for the lack of a better description, because every time I've lived in uh, about six and a half different countries, uh, I count Kenya as half because I was only there for six months. Um, and I think every country I lived has been a process of adaptation, as well as my own professional journey, uh, going from private sector, uh, working on uh, technology, project management, to uh, change, branching out to, um, I guess, social uh, welfare, uh, well-being, and, and uh, going to disaster risk uh, management um, about six, seven years ago. And uh, so all this has been a journey of adaptation for me as a person. And deep adaptation, uh, as you mentioned, it's been an absolute honor to have met you and Jem and uh, working together with you uh, at the, uh, the, the retreat that you've uh, hosted two years ago, which I consider one of my, uh, yeah, just going really deeper into understanding uh, deep adaptation what it means for me, and as well as day of adaptation. Mm, thank you. Yeah, we're gonna. I'm gonna ask you to talk about your um, your journey to deep adaptation and collapse awareness and the work that you're doing now with day, day of adaptation. But you shared something with me um, earlier, which I'm really curious about. Um, you said that you are in constant reconciliation between the freedom of knowledge and the constraints of reality. And then you said, for one, the concrete tiles in the garden have often called your attention and action. Can you talk a little bit more about that, please? <laughs> yes, uh, we, so my husband and I will live in the house that we first rented when we moved here. 
um, the constraints is in the fact that uh, the house is constructed and re refurbished by our landlord previously, and we were told not to do much. And so I would look down right now, if I'm looking out, I can see the little garden, which is the size of a big bathtub. For the, just to to so you, to show everything in Netherlands so much smaller, but it's covered in tiles, and um, we we uh, we just struggle with what do we do. How do we convince our landlord uh, that uh, we can make it into a greener space, for example? Um, yeah, that's uh, the knowledge of adaptation, knowing that uh, of course for urban space we need we really need more green space as opposed to mere a more uh, gray area. Thanks. That was quite a conundrum. You've helped me understand what you meant then. Thank you. Yes. So I know that um, your engagement with, with deep adaptation and collapse awareness and your own process of integrating what that means for you and your life and your work has been uh, quite a journey. Could, could you talk about, your, about that journey of collapse awareness for you, how and when you discovered deep adaptation and got involved. Right, um, yeah, and thank you for that question. Uh, for me, it, uh, it, it happened about three years ago. Uh, so I was already working on adaptation topic uh, when working at Global Center on Adaptation, um, which is a high level uh, climate organization based in Rotterdam. Um, I was, not as much as I enjoyed working there, working with different international organizations, what I noticed missing for me was uh, to have a local contact, um, contact as well as just working with, uh, working with uh, not just policies, not just reports, uh, but with actions, with concrete initiatives. For example, I, I would rather have some, some groups to work with how to how to turn my garden convince my landlord um so the personal space the local actions um and i think the reconciliation between what's on paper in the reports uh and trans the, the the discrepancy between the lack of action on the ground um and uh I, that that's around the time when though uh, I just started having more conversations with just people around me, even strangers, even uh, friends as well. What does climate change, cl particularly climate action mean to them? Um, and I realized as much as we're, we have this sort of high level narrative on state actors, governments to take action, uh, but uh, local level, whether it's people, communities and, and organizations, there hasn't been as much. Um, also just reflecting high level climate organizations. Are we doing as organizations, are, how sustainable are our own actions and activities uh, are flying constantly, uh, constant flying for different conferences. How sustainable is that? Uh, and me being part of that uh, to, to reflect on that as well. And that's around the time I uh, started just reflecting, what does that mean for me as an adaptation uh, professional? And uh, doing more research and came across uh, Jam's paper. And I really very much connected in terms of sort of the, the, the structural uh, bias that we have being part of that, the existing institutions um, to support the narrative that uh, that's avoiding seeing the reality for what it is. Uh, even though there's limitations, um, we, we kind of need to take our head up from ignoring that and uh, rather acknowledge the constraints that we're facing. That is not gonna be easy. It's gonna be a very tough and challenging journey for ad adaptation. Um, and that's around the time when we met in Bristol um, to start to, to having the conversation about what deep adaptation means. Um, yeah, so, and it's been, uh, and then just very briefly, so that was the start of the journey. And then uh, six months later, we had the workshop, uh, the, the retreat in Greece and where we um, went, went into a lot uh, deeper on the four R's and uh, working with the others as well. Yeah, thank you. 
Um, as you know, uh, there is a lot of criticism of deep adaptation, the forum, the framework as um, doomism. Mm. And um, that um, yeah, we, we shouldn't give up hope and that takes away any um, agency or motivation to take action. But that hasn't been the case for you at all. I know that. Um, so I'm wondering about... Um, yeah, so I know that then you you began this non-profit day of adaptation. And yeah, I'm wondering around that, the um, your own processing, your own um, reorientation, and then how that um, turned into this new project. Um, it's, it's a good point and good observation as well. I, it's true, I having... I do suffer from the moments of really getting depressed about what we're facing. Uh, I think it's about the, the mechanism, how the approach, um, it is heavy. Um, I remember showing the deep adaptation paper uh, to a, a, another um, board member in the beginning of setting up day of adaptation. And uh, when discussing it, she said she was feeling so depressed uh, after reading it. And so we had a really, good conversation about it. Um, to me personally, I think fear itself is uh, not, uh, fear itself is not, um, was the only thing that could stop us. Um, but what, what helps for me is to find the balance in uh, bringing out what are the ways to also bring out hope. And that's to look at uh, some of the things that really inspires me, the solution space, working together, uh, I mentioned local level, working together with partners, with other people, uh, adaptation. So focus on the narrative, an, an alternative narrative. And I think that's where um, just maybe a good segue into my work at Day of Adaptation. Uh, our approach has been uh, focused around fun, interactive, engaging group activities um, on climate change. So finding this angle. And I think I, I've said this several times to my colleagues uh, that has, that I need that personally for the work to be in that space, to be able to have that balance. Uh, and I think that's important um, for me personally and for many people um, not just look at the doom and gloom uh, scenarios, but also look at what is it that we can do together. Yeah. Mm. And um, in terms of that keeping balance, I know you spend a lot of time outdoors, don't you? <laughs> Every time <laughs> we email each other, I'm telling you I'm going camping. Or <laughs> mm -hmm. It's true, I do. Yes, that's part of the balance as well. Thank you for yeah. reminding me of that. Yes. Um, so can you tell us about the activities that you've developed through Day of Adaptation? Sure. Um, the Actually, a good segue is I remember when, when we met in Bristol three years ago, uh, I was sharing the idea of Dave adaptation with Jim and you. And I remember Jim being very sharp as he is, he was, he is, uh, just ask me the question, okay, so you're gonna do climate communication. Uh, what are you going to do? That's gonna be so different from what all the other organizations or professionals have been doing for decades. Uh, and that really put me on the spot because at the time I did not have the answer. I simply had the, sort of I saw the, the challenge, I wanted to uh, work on that challenge. So luckily two, two years later, uh, three and a half years later, I do have the answer in terms of what our mission and our approach. So I'm happy to share that with you. Um, in short, I already mentioned that just now, uh, which is our uh, approach. Um, what I didn't mention is our mission uh, is to empower people, community and organizations to understand, accept, and commit to climate action. And uh, the highlight of this is we, our target group, our organizations and communities, the teams uh, that we choose to work and live with. 
So that's very, that's quite difficult, uh, di different from some of the other narratives you, we might come across more focused on either, I mentioned government, state government level or individual level. Um, so that's one. Uh, and our approach is to reflect um, fun, interactive group activities with these teams of uh, community and organizations. Um, so at first we had this uh, superhero themed dialogue day where we had that in, in uh, some of the uh, no other nonprofit organizations, our, our schools here. So everyone was uh, in a way superheroes where they have uh, whether super, uh, uh, Wonder Woman or Batman, like to, so they activate their visions to see what's really happening around us with regards to climate change and share that with each other in smaller groups. So that's one. And the second one is uh, a board game, a climate um, board game called Minions of Disruptions. Um, and I can tell you, I'm not a board game designer, a climate professional background, and also actually uh, I'm Chinese, which means I'm not exactly, fun is not exactly in my DNA, but you know, um, fake it to make it because we, we, uh, we kind of want to create a different uh, approach on engaging people. Um, so we had the board game and uh, since Corona, we actually went, so I wanna show you guys this, a uh, one and a half meter, like sort of distance friendly board game um, where people sit, ar sit around the game and the, the narrative is that we uh, or their uh, emissions, these uh, minions creating disruptions in our neighborhood or organization. So there are two different versions. And uh, what can we do about it? What are we experiencing? The disruptions we're experiencing um, and some of the initiatives that we can carry out. I can tell you, I have been absolutely enjoying the journey of creating that narrative with my colleagues, as well as just facilitating some of the discussions. What I can do is to sh share with you briefly my screen because then you get a visual of how the, some of the activity looks like in reality. So this is just a, a photo collage of uh, uh, some of the game day activity we've had. So that's with a team from a bank, a local bank called Abbey and Amaro. They're all IT people. I was uh, really impressed that uh, they actually had some very insightful questions in terms of how their team can deal with some of the disruptions like droughts, for example. We went online and this is another group, uh, community group. I'm not sure you can see this in the background. There's a 10 year old who we were not sure if he could play the game and turns out he was leading the game experience and the conversation, which just knocked everyone, knocked all the adults out of the water. Um, so I just wanna show you this. Um, this is what, going back to the question, this is, reflects our approach. Um, that you see, yes, the situation, the, the scenarios are tough, challenging, I'll stop sharing, um, but we can still create that space where it's welcoming, uh, it's, it's open to have that conversation, to invite the conversation. Um, so yes, I'll, I'll stop there and just a little bit about uh, the, oh, actually one, one more thing. Um, of course, so we've been playing this, having these dialogue days and, and game days, uh, I think in the past two years, we've had uh, around 15 game day with whether organization communities online and uh, also physically with more than 200 participants um, and it's quite well received. So we're actually looking at some of the partnership to, to uh, scale up as well. Uh, most recently, we played with the uh, Deep Adaptation uh, Forum core team as well as uh, a couple other uh, groups as well, which you were part of it as well, Katie. <laughs> yeah, I was, I was. And um, I have to admit, before I joined, I was really um, unconvinced and, and a bit skeptical about the gamifying of this. Um, yeah, I wondered about, and I'm gonna ask you about this actually, about how, how you have seen 
the impact with other people and organizations engaging but around whether or not the um this fun and engaging comms slant would make it easy to um to way, like an alternative kind of denial you know not engaging with the issues i joined and um I did find it very fun. I enjoyed engaging with my uh, with my colleagues, and the thing that has stayed with me most was um, so I I played the community version, and there's an organisation version as well. The thing that has stayed with me most has been was the extent to which my knowledge and understanding of the complexity of the different. Um, aspects and institutions and services that were happening that could be impacted how they would impact upon each other and also the noticing even me and I have done an awful lot of work around uh, self-regulation and co-regulation the extent to which the kind of simulated additional pressure mm. impacted on the way that I engaged um, but yeah so I loved it I really loved it I think there's um, uh, a a lot of benefit for lots of different contexts. Um, but I do want to go back to this, this question of the what felt to me a bit discordant around using a game approach. Right. Um, so I think to, to your point, um, um, the gamification process is only a means to an end. And uh, the end in this case is an alternative way of communicating climate change, the complexity, like as you mentioned, com complexity of it in a way that is uh, inviting. Uh, and it's, it's known that one of the barriers with engagement, climate engagement is the, the doom and gloom, pure doom and gloom discussion uh, alone is not sufficient. So, uh, or, so, so the question is, how do we develop alternatives? Um, so in this case, my inspiration uh, actually came from, uh, let's say, my husband um, and, and also his friends who are into board games. And uh, so I think that's one of the things that caught my attention. If, if this is something people are willing to do in their spare time uh, and they're not forced to do it, so maybe there's something that we can latch onto and just hey, what if people actually like enjoying the game so much that they're willing to do this at their own time or paying for it, which is the case uh, for us, uh, which would generate the uh, funds necessary to even engage more organizations or schools that don't necessarily have the funds. So that's really where the thinking got started. Um, the experience is um, to not just portray the complexity, but also inviting people. So they have, they can develop, share, develop this common language. Uh, what's, what quite often we see is, and this is in organizations, so, so typical, come back to the bank example, for example, um, in this case, what we heard afterwards is everyone, of course, knows about climate change in their own private setting or reading about news, but in their workplace, as a team, they have never, had this conversation. And uh, in fact, before this uh, game day, which is held at a park, um, the team member reflected afterwards, someone write a re reflection piece voluntarily, you know, that when he was told there's an event, he wasn't told what it was other than the topic, which is sustainability and climate. He was already dreading there is gonna be a boring lecture. And he was pleasantly surprised and well, as well as his colleagues, that is a very fun experience. So we played the game and then we had a break and then uh, we had this one hour conversation to bring the topic back to their own team, back to the reality. And some of the questions were, you know, for your, uh, either your team or your organization or the clients, how would these extreme climate scenarios impact to you droughts for example that's some heat waves in netherlands where i live now that's not something people are familiar with um, and it's quite um 
quite encouraging to see the responses coming from their own team. For example, um, someone was suggesting, you know, we need to offer different products to clients. Consider the, the insurance, for example, or the financing tools we're offering to clients. Or someone said, even for our own team, we should have flexible work hours or having siestas. And I think when reading the results afterwards, um, what struck me is it's far more interesting for the team to take this list of ideas that's generated by themselves after this experience, as opposed to for an expert coming in and tell them, you should do this, you should do that. Um, it's a very strong bottom-up approach. So that's one. And another thing I remember I was really impressed was um, one of the question was, how likely are you take, willing to take action as, a, as an individual, as a team, or as an organization? And the highest response was as a team. It was twice likely than as an organization and the, as individuals somewhere in between. So uh, the togetherness, togetherness uh, is in our, we, we, are, we recognize that social climate change is not an individual issue, it's a collective issue. And I think the very next category of togetherness, togetherness um, that everyone we're feeling comfortable with is in the immediate team. Like in this conversation, this is an environment where we feel comfortable, we have that direct connection uh, with each other. So that was another very revealing point. Um, but yes, so I was happy that this kind of game day experience to generate uh, ideas from the, the participants themselves that's relevant for them. Thanks. Um, I'm going to uh, shortly ask Balash, I might have pronounced that wrong, again, to ask his question. But first, I've got, I've got one last question for you, Shu. And um, in, when I played the game, uh, I'm going to admit, admit out loud for the first time I cheated. Um, <laughs> and um, I know that, yeah, the way it works and the intensity that builds up and the way that, you, that I experienced it, and in this um, kind of simulated context, different parts of, of what keep the community coherent can begin to collapse and then have knock-on effects mm -hmm. and so I'm wondering ab about whether if um, when you've played the game in with the I think you said 100 over the last no I can't remember when you've played this in real time with people um, what happens when people experience that when their collective agency doesn't save the day um, and how do you hold space around the, the connection between this is a game, it's a simulation, and also look at what's happening in the world? Yeah. Um, so the, okay, so to, to answer your question, the game is a simulation, it's a, it's a model of reality. Uh, in the game, it's both teams. So, so for those who have not seen the board game, each game uh, each team of three to four people is, is an organizational community and then, then they're multiples forming a network and during the game between communities organizations can be both competitive as well as collaborative so that's a very uh, interesting dynamic that you don't see in typical uh, game setting and um, to answer your question Katie in reality in physical forms actually it's not much different from online forms I think it's in physical forms it's easier right for people to go over to another board game and having that conversation of can, do you want to work together on this project we need to pay this month and negotiation um, the key thing is it comes down to human nature it brings out that climate change climate action at the end of it we're still dealing with humans and uh, the leaders or the group dynamics between organizations. So how can we collaborate despite the um, challenges, the constraints of reality? Uh, can we make it happen if I think one of the collaboration is it costs a certain amount of funding. My team only has like small amount of funding. Your team has more. Can we still make this collaboration happen knowing that maybe down the road we can return the favor, for example. So it really highlights 
that uh, the flexibility, if you the willingness to make something happen, and vice versa, the disruption that is has knocked down knock on effect. I think people are aware of that uh, in a cognitive cognitive way, uh, but when you experience that in a tangible way, so physically experience that, and then you mentioned that earlier, like the the timing pressure. Um, so that's always something that we uh, try to portray through, through the game. It's not about us telling people that climate action is, there's an urgent need for that or uh, that you need to collaborate. People deduct an experience through their own experience. And uh, so after the game experience, it opens up possibilities um, for that discussion to potentially form a non-traditional partnership, for example. Yes, the that aspect of the um, the psychology of collaboration or competition and it is really really beautifully uh, designed into the game as well. Um, I want to ask uh, Balash, please, if you're ready with your question, you can unmute yourself. Yes, thank you very much, Katie. I hope you can hear me well. Thanks. Um, well, my question is, I just. Uh, I'm curious to hear your experience. How is it regarding the attitude of people, both in organizational and community level, when you were actually confronting them with reality? Um, one of the qu uh, questions, survey questions we ask after the game is to describe the game experience in a few, few, uh, few words or sentences. Confront, confronting is one of the common responses we see. Um, I think, so, and, and this comes from some of the Dutch participants even. So, and you know, Dutch are very direct. So for them to say confronting, it really does mean is quite confront, confrontational. Um, and I think based on people's responses, I think it's actually welcomed because it's tied into the, the fun, innovative space. Uh, and, that is allowing people to have that critical discussion with each other. Uh, people who don't necessarily work in climate change, but everyone's aware of it. Uh, it's, it's sort of like poking through the, the layer uh, of, of uh, pretending that it doesn't. So it's actually getting over the denial, so the confronting the issue as it is um, to, to uh, have, a, have a different conversation about solution space, about what we can do. Um, so it's actually, it, in retrospect, it becomes the easier part of the game. Does that make sense? It's, as much as confront, confronting, it's actually, it becomes just, it, it's, it opens up the space behind it. Yeah, well, but I'm also curious that how often did you experience uh, the good old denial and what forms of it, if you did? Yes, uh, we definitely did. Uh, we when not not often, but we still uh, do get responses. Uh, and I've heard from a couple of individuals who said uh, it's uh, you know is it really caused by human action, for example, or uh, it's it's fake news. I've, I've received different range of denialism. But what's interesting is um, to uh, uh, for their colleagues to see this. Again, uh, people who don't not only talk about climate change with each other. So it's actually sort of like, huh, I didn't know that this person holds this view. That changes the dynamic uh, or discussion. Um, but it's still welcome enough for everyone to share their view, to not to be afraid to, to have that space for discussion. Um, I think that's, that's unique. It's almost like the same effect of having a beer over the bar to talk about this without drinking but um so i think we need to have this space this open welcoming space where people can have this conversation uh we all came like i can speak from my own experience i think generations a decade ago more than a decade ago when i was talking to my husband husband he wasn't sure i mean it's still to him is news and new information and there's a process of we have to ex except for some people, there's a process of uh, acceptance. Some are longer than others, but um, if we shun people from opening up, then it would just, 
the issue will just grow uh, manifest. At least that's my personal opinion. Thank you. Thanks. I'm going to ask uh, Sasha, would you like to ask your question to Shu now? Yes, thank you. Um, Shu, so I'm really curious to experience the game. And uh, I just wonder, are there ways that people can join a group online that is that's set up to do it? Or how long does it take? Like if, if I were to try to organize to do the game, but what, what kind of expectations would I want to set for people? Sure. Thank you, Sasha. And thank you, Balas, uh, for the question just now. Um, and uh, I love your enthusiasm, Sasha. You just, uh, it, it's almost like I, you're asking the question I wish you would be asking. <laughs> um, to answer your question, we typically organize them uh, for community teams of community and organizations. And it's, uh, it's about three hours. Uh, so where a day of adaptation, the experience is like days, game days, we consider this as units of where people want to discuss them. Um, so three hours, I would say is a comfortable time window for, for this engagement experience. And you can contact us, uh, just send me an email. Um, I will leave my email address uh, here in the chat window. And um, we can uh, see how to arrange that. Um, for a group between, uh, we usually say between six to 30 plus uh, because the game is very scalable as well. We've played this for, you can in, 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 in theory scale this up quite a, quite a bit. Um, and uh, uh, what else? Right, in terms of open sessions, we currently don't have any uh, sort of drop-in sessions uh, because uh, well, that may change in the future. I don't, I don't, we haven't discussed this option, but from our experience, what works best is indeed with uh, what I call, what we call units of resilience, almost like your immediate community or organization, because at the end of the experience, we want the, 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 the participants to have a sense of we're in this together. There's something we can do together um, for, for our local space. So I hope that I answered your question there, Sasha. Okay, great. I, I just have one. Yeah. So I one sec. I did take part a little bit in the one that you the demonstration you did for the business and finance group, and there was a little bit of tech that I didn't fully understand at the beginning uh, with you know getting online. It, would there be somebody to help with that, or do we need to have someone on the team who understood that? Um, we can, uh, yes, the online, thanks for reminding me of that. I was thinking you look very familiar. It's been a while, but um, the get online version, what Sasha is referring to, is on a platform called Tabletopia. Uh, so we, we just to have a tutorial to make sure people can use the space. And, um, and also, uh, because it's a collaborative space, and I think what Katie said as well, you know, we at Deep Adaptation, we're, well, we're, we're very... Uh, uh, sort of failure friendly. If anything fails, someone cannot get online. It's a great opportunity to collaborate with your team members to figure out how you can support each other and still enjoy the experience. Uh, and uh, so, yeah, it, it's it's a uh, because I think the game space allows that as well. Thanks, Hugh. And it's it my understanding that um, the development so far has been on a voluntary has been through voluntary effort and um, you are looking it's not funded for rolling out for free um, so yes it is possible it was offered to to deep adaptation groups but um, to for there needs to be a, you're looking for ways for it to be financially sustained right typically for organizations with financial means uh, we do have a sort of a standard fee arrangement or a sliding scale depends on the we, we have uh, charged uh, for example the bank or uh, that we worked with or municipality or some uh, um, non other nonprofit with financial means um, to support the effort of yeah indeed what you mentioned development and design effort um, but uh, and also we want to scale up 
to roll out. And we've also offered this as a, at a much discounted rate to universities and sometimes free for schools and communities. Uh, the key thing, so our mission is about um, impact driven. So we want to make that happen uh, to reach more people to offer this uh, as, a, as a way to inspire other innovative ideas to communicate about climate change with uh, different tar target groups. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. And then I'm gonna ask um, Jonathan, would you like to ask your question? Um, hi, uh, it's just so interesting. Uh, thank you very much. Um, and uh, and I, I was wondering that in the kind of scenario uh, uh, in the game, is, is it a sort of deep adaptation assumption, you know, that we assume things are going to collapse and fall apart mm. and how are we going to deal with that? Um, or, or is it a sort of range of disasters and transformations of various kinds and therefore a range of adaptations? How, how are you thinking about that? We, uh, thanks, Jonathan, for that question. Um, in the game, we communicate disruptions through a deck of cards that's randomly uh, occurring. One of the uh, cards is indeed more uh, leaning towards sort of, uh, you know, something, I think it's a situation flooding happens in the community. We're not sure if we can rebuild like uh, the community. So it's quite devastating and reflecting on the effect uh, that could be just knockout uh, effect. Um, and I will say the game definitely reflects the, it works with the essential functions of community or organization. So it's very much reflecting on uh, the resilience aspect of things. What do we value? And of course, as the game design, we have selected certain aspects and there's, there's an arbitrary, um, there's, a, there's, a, there's an arbitrary choice there. Uh, but part of the discussion could be reflecting, hey, as our own community organization, are there other things that we value that we uh, we, we want to uh, preserve, for example, a resilience aspect. Uh, restoration are more through, I think we have definitely uh, initiative cards that, re, uh, that, that uh, represent restoration aspect. Uh, reconciliation very much sort of through the confronting dynamic of between teams or between players. Uh, when differences come up, uh, sort of how to reconcile. And uh, I'm missing an R. Can someone help me out? I said reconciliation, restoration, resilience. Re uh, Relinquishment. Thank you. To let go. Um, that one... We do have some aspects about sort of lifestyle reflection in the initiatives or uh, in initiative cars. Uh, so the game itself, uh, in summary, it does reflect different aspects of the four R's. Um, is it deep enough? Probably not. We were actually, I think, after playing with the, the core team a couple of months ago, and I was thinking like in the future, it would be really nice to have a version that's sort of more on the deeper end of adaptation process. Um, more transformative, not just re resilience uh, preservation, but uh, more transformative experience. Um, but it is a model of what we're going through now, as most communities and organizations do. Thank you very much. I, I have a load more questions, but I don't want to hog the, the space, maybe another time, or I'll write them out. Yeah. Um, I would suggest to type them out, because uh, I think regardless we get to answer them or not, uh, one thing I really appreciate is today's session, I was thinking, what is my goal today? It's really just to share my uh, my own experience with deep adaptation, as well as the work we're doing at Dave, at Dave Adaptation. But also this exchange of questions, uh, it's really one, it's very valuable. Uh, I have a colleague who joined recently and I, I was encouraging her to share her questions uh, because that way we can work on addressing them and exchanging these ideas. So please do share those questions. Um, my colleague, Minya, has been encouraging me to write more uh, blog. And for example, the game, ex like, so the, the game journey. Uh, so I'm just about to hopefully next week to share this on our blog, uh, on our website, website, how this game experience came to be, what is the theory of change behind it? Um, 
And I think I saw in the beginning, Stuart, thanks that you shared the website <laughs> for me. And this goes to show how bad I am with the uh, generally um, marketing side. I, I'm just not up to it. Thank you for, for helping. Uh, so yeah, check out our website or find us on LinkedIn. Um, that's a good place to exchange ideas and questions. Thank you. Yeah, Shu, what I will do is make sure that everybody who's, who registered to join this session um, gets your website in the in the post event email that we send out, and also when the re when the recording goes onto Gem's YouTube channel, um, we'll include your details there too. Sounds great. Um, so I uh, <laughs> I've received a private question, um, uh, which says I would love to hear about your thoughts about cheating. Um, I think cheating is a microcosm for what is going to happen as society breaks down and your instinct to cheat is what we all will eventually do. And I'm not going to name this person because they didn't uh, ask that to be called out, but um, it right. is a, it, it was a, yeah, directed at me because I said that I was, um, I cheated in the game. And um, so one of the reflections I had through it, the experience was, um, it challenged a lot of it, it it was kind of as I said I, I've been involved in deep adaptation for a long time I regularly practice the the deep listening and the um uh reflection and processing um sides and being involved in your game revealed parts of me that I didn't know were there um and yes one of them was around cheating and it was confronting to me there was a kind of oh, this is a game, it's fun. And also there was a part of me that really did not want to lose. You know, it really, really made space for this, um, the competitive yeah. element of me. Um, and, I, and one of the reflections that I shared with you, we, we were kind of like a guinea pig group for you, weren't we? Um, but making space around the actual um, game experience for the debriefing of that kind of stuff. So, and that's where the, um, the game focuses on the, the outer, the actions, the practical resilience in communities and organisations, but the, the inner reflection and change is what can happen outside working, mm. with, working with the team. Um, that's a very good point. Uh, to be fair, um, we could probably have a whole day experience after playing like a full day experience after playing the game to really dig into the, the inter uh, sort of the inner inner experience as well as group dynamics. What you're describing Katie is, is very true. It shows different personality that we might not be aware of the um, Harari, Harari window, right? Like what you are aware of or not aware of our personality. And um, I, I know, me for one, even though I designed the game, I am terrified every time I play the game because I know how tough it is and <laughs> how much I need my team. Um, and they look at me as if I know everything about the team, but I'm, you know, once the, the team has, the game has a mind of its own, right? Just like climate dimension. So <laughs> we're, I love how you are, sorry, touching, uh, it's true. It's, 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 it gets us going, but this is why it's necessary to have the space. Um, so game is not always just fun. Um, someone else, a game master, Nancy Bears, who I work with here in Netherlands, she said, you know, it's a myth that games are all fun most of the time is frustration, but I think it's true in a way, but it, regardless of what it is, it act, activates some more dimension of emotions that we have about climate change topic that is not just passive on the receiving end of another bad news, another bad news. It's like we're actively involved in this conversation. Um, and having said that, I think uh, the question about cheating is probably more directed to you. My two cents there is it actually the game challenges us in reflecting what our values are and in the context and what we consider as more important. So I think it's actually a good, healthy exercise um, of reconciliation. Yeah, I forgave myself quite quickly. Um, uh, I want to invite one last question, or maybe two, we'll see how we go, uh, from Christine. 
Um, yeah, can you briefly read out your question for us, please, Christine? I'm wondering about whether you've used this game in schools and colleges, and are you in discussion with education departments about this? I'm very um, concerned that we should teach climate truth, and there are many eco schools in the UK, but I'm not sure how much the curriculum for students has changed to encompass the knowledge and the skills that they'll need in the future. So. I thank you, Christine, for that question. Um, it is something that becomes very clear to me. Uh, education is so essential and it's, uh, you know, quite often we talk about hard infrastructure. Once it's developed, it's hard to adapt. And yet we have sort of youth growing up, still learning, following the same curriculum. And I, 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 have, I share the same concern that we need to update the curriculum to add, introduce more elements where youth can start thinking about how they need to uh, adapt and put their time and effort towards um, the subjects they're interested, you know, just not just engineering, but climate engineering, uh, sorry, climate aware engineering, for example. Um, so to answer your question, we, um, we have had limited experience um, in engaging school. And this is sort of the Achilles of, um, uh, of our organization. This is quite transparent, but I think, it's, uh, uh, it's easy to, uh, for me to share because I am not Dutch. So which means I, my network here in the Netherlands is actually quite weak. Uh, my, my Dutch is good enough, but uh, uh, forming network, developing that trust takes time. Uh, so this is a process that's taking quite a while, a long while. In the meantime, uh, it seems like my, uh, you know, just organizations who speak English and have, that I worked with in past professional network has, has a more interest. Um, so one of the hope, of course, is if you see, if you have network that you will be interested to put us in touch with, uh, absolutely. Um, like I mentioned earlier, I was impressed this 10 year old, and I think Sasha, you were in another call where another 10 year old was just raised, ace the game. Uh, and sh share so much wonderful in insight. Um, and we want to see more of that, to invite voices from each other to hear this. Um, and I'm gonna run out of time for sharing the story, but I need to share this. Just last week, I was at a skate park meeting another colleague, her daughter was skateboarding with another friend, 11, nine year old. So I was told by the, the friend after the IPCC report came out, her 11 year old daughter um, decided to double up her effort in cleaning up garbage around the, picking up garbage around the neighborhood. You know, to me, that's like the expression of eco anxiety. She's doing what she can. And then when we were talking about that, the nine year old and 10 year old, two little girls were having this conversation about, you know, are you eating, uh, are you vegetarian? Or no, I'm not, or, or I'm eating meat. And I was listening to that. It was just part of my heart was, was, um, yeah, uh, hurting to see that, like, you know, this is the conversation that they're having this, uh, where adults are not. I, and afterwards, I reflected with my husband, we need to have this conversation. And even for the kids, not just on the playground, when they are sort of feeling like almost like a refuge from, from this discussion, we want to have the space to discuss this in classroom, where they're welcomed. Um, so yes, we, and through this game, we can introduce those questions and open up a space. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, if you sent a question and we didn't have time to get around to it, I'm very, very sorry. Um, we will be sharing, as we said earlier, Shu's, um, Shu's website so that you can contact her afterwards. Um, but I just want to say a huge thanks to all of you who have joined. Huge thanks to those of you who asked questions. Big thanks to um, Stuart for supporting today and Shu, especially for your, for your time. It's been a huge pleasure. Thank you very much. And thank you very much, Katie, for hosting this. You're a fantastic gem. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you, everyone, for joining us.